My thing with Tillian is I kind of hate seeing pictures of him because he has such great arms. I'm just like, what did I do to lose the genetic lottery that he very clearly won? What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are gonna talk about Dance Gavin Dance, the band I said I would never make a video about, and yet here we are talking about them. Why? Well, it's actually pretty simple. It just kind of drives me nuts whenever there's something in the world that I don't understand or can't figure out. And the question I've been asking myself for the past few years is what is the deal with Dance Gavin Dance? How is a band that sounds as weird as they do, that's changed singers three times, that doesn't do like any kind of crazy stuff on social media, as big and successful as they are? They've hit the Billboard Top 20 a few times. They've got a million listeners on Spotify. They're headlining big tours. What's their secret? That is the question that I'm gonna do my best to answer in this video. But before I get into it, a few things that I wanna mention. Number one, if you haven't yet, please check out the Punk Rock NBA podcast. There's a link to that in the description. Number two, for everybody who was asked, yes, I do have merch. Link to that in the description as well. And number three, if you wanna talk about business with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. I've been publishing a lot of stuff over there. There's a link to that in the description as well. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. If you are watching this and you're probably very familiar with this band, but for those of you who aren't, let me give you a quick introduction. They're, I guess what you call a post-hardcore band that's been around for about 15 years and they sound like this. Or this. They've put out, I think, nine albums, two or three of which have hit the Billboard Top 20. Like I said, they've got a million listeners on Spotify. They've got their own record label. They've got their own festival. They headline, you know, 1,200 cap venues. They're doing very well for themselves. And they also have one of the absolute most dedicated fan bases of any band you'll ever find on the planet. Like the kind of people who literally might actually take a bullet for this band. And their success has been a little bit of a mystery to me. Not because they're bad or anything like that. It's not necessarily my cup of tea, but I recognize that they're very good at what they do. It's just that in terms of the conventional wisdom about what makes a band successful, they don't really check all the boxes that you would expect. For one, their music. I think it's pretty safe to say that they don't write the most accessible stuff in the world. And that's not a bad thing at all. I just mean that they deliberately write music that's a little bit left of center, a little bit weird, a little bit challenging. And also nobody in the band is like a classic rock star kind of figure like say a Haley Williams or a Pete Wentz where it's obvious that this is a band that revolves around that person and their charisma. I just really couldn't figure it out for the longest time. I mean, they really shouldn't be as successful as they are according to the conventional wisdom. And that really bothered me because anytime there's millions of people out there who like something, whether I personally enjoy it or not, I always want to understand at least why other people like it. I think that I have solved the mystery of Dance Gavin Dance. And I think that the answer really comes down to three things. Number one, what I'm calling the wheelie wheelie gene. Number two, their anti-rock star appeal. And number three, the community that they've created. So first up, what do I mean by the wheelie wheelie gene? Well, I think Dance Gavin Dance is one of those bands where it's a really binary thing, like either you like them or you don't. I think of it kind of like cilantro. I personally love cilantro, but some people, I think like 30% of people or something, have a gene that to them makes cilantro taste like soap. And because of that gene, those people hate cilantro because who wants to eat soap, right? And I think with Dance Gavin Dance, it's kind of the same thing. Like if you have the wheedly wheedly gene, that part of your brain that makes Will Swan guitar parts sound good to you, then you love Dance Gavin Dance, follow Troy, Circus Survive, Protest the Hero, Hail the Sun, and all those other bands that play that kind of like over the top, super technical, post hardcore with super crazy wheelie wheelie guitar parts and song structures that, you know, don't really make a lot of sense. It's just one of those things that either sounds good to you or it doesn't. And I personally don't have that gene, so I don't really like that kind of stuff. But if I'm being objective, listening to Dance Gavin Dance compared to the rest of the genre, I do think they do it better than pretty much anybody else. If I had to narrow it down to one thing, I would say that what sets them apart from the rest of the genre is that they have kind of a level of jazzy pop appeal to it that I don't hear from a lot of the other bands in the genre. And the reason why that is so important is because it gives their music a sense of dynamics that's missing from a lot of the other bands in the genre. I mean, if your songs are just all crazy wheelie wheelie parts back to back, then you kind of get numb to it, right? The same as death metal bands that just play blast beats all the time or death core bands that just play breakdowns all the time. Like if everything is heavy, then nothing is heavy. And if everything is crazy, then nothing is crazy, right? 
What you really need is contrast. So when they put in those more straightforward pop kind of parts, then the chaotic, crazy, wheelie wheelie parts hit that much harder. And whether you like their music or not, you certainly have to admit that they're very good players. And in most genres, especially like popular ones, I actually don't think technical ability matters at all. But this is one genre where it does matter because the crazier your wheely wheely parts are, the better. I mean, that's like the whole appeal of this style, right? So what it comes down to is if you don't like weird, noodly, technical, progressive, post-hardcore, whatever you want to call it, then you are not going to like Dance Gavin Dance. But if you do, if you have the wheelie wheelie gene, although I'm not a huge fan of this style, in my opinion, they do the most like polished, accessible version of this style. And so it makes perfect sense to me that they dominate this scene. You're already a voice inside my head. And second, their image, which I would call almost like an anti-rock star kind of image. At first glance, like I said, you might think that nobody in this band has like that crazy huge star power. I mean, there's nobody in the band that's a Halsey or Billie Eilish or a Pete Wentz or a Haley Williams or a Post Malone, where there's just that obvious undeniable megastar charisma that can carry a whole band. But actually, I think it's not quite that simple because because every member of this band, I think, brings something a little bit different to the table that adds up to more than what it might seem at first glance. I think of it kind of like X-Men or the Avengers, where each one of them kind of has their own special power that they bring to the group. And then, with their powers combined, they are the ultimate Wheelie Wheelie Telecaster Boys. I think really what it comes down to is relatability. And I've talked before about how a lot of other bands have used that, how they're almost like the idealized version of their own fans. Blink-182 were the idealized version of the 90s suburban skateboarder kid. Five Finger Death Punch are the idealized version of that, like, red state military bro. Periphery are the idealized version of that bedroom producer gent kid. And I think Dance Gavin Dance or the idealized version of the like plaid shirt and Telecaster math rock guy. In particular, their guitarist, Will Swan, who I see as really the leader of the band, which is a little bit unusual because usually the vocalist is the center of the band. But from what I can tell, he's kind of the main creative force behind the band. His guitar parts are often the focus of the song more than anything else. And he has a super dedicated legion of mega passionate Will Swan fans. To put a finer point on it, his name is literally on half of the things in their genre. Like the genre itself is called Swancore, which is basically bands that sound like Dance Gavin Dance, and he's in half of them. His label, Blue Swan Records, puts out a bunch of those bands. Their festival is called Swan Fest. So he's definitely at the center of this, but I think their secret weapon is that it's not just him. Their vocalist Tillian may not be like a Post Malone level of like giant mega charismatic superstar, but he definitely does have some charisma. He seems like a really likable, chill guy, pretty funny on Twitter, and he is a good looking guy. And let's be honest, looks matter in the music business. My thing with Tillian is I kind of hate seeing pictures of him because he has such great arms. And I'm just like, what did I do to lose the genetic lottery that he very clearly won? I think you also have to give their former vocalist Johnny Craig a lot of credit for helping them get traction during the early days of the band. I won't get into the whole history of him and the band and all that stuff because that's a whole other video. And if you're watching this, you probably already know it. But I will say that he's probably the most charismatic like rock star person that's ever been in the band. And although he is a very troubled guy, as most of you watching this probably know, I think having him as the front man of the band during the early days was really important to kind of giving him that first jump start. And speaking of vocalists, the fact that they have changed vocalists three times and not only survived, but have gotten bigger, really kind of proves my point. Changing a vocalist once kills most bands, but the reason they could survive is because it's never been just about any one person in the band. In fact, if anything, all the drama surrounding their various lineup changes really only help them. I mean, I personally find the drama and all that stuff kind of exhausting and tiring and pointless, but it is what the music media likes to talk about and it got them in a lot of headlines and that helps. With all of that being said, I think a lot of their appeal actually comes from their relatability. The fact that they aren't those like larger than life rock star types. Their screamer John Mess comes to mind here. They do the like clean screaming trade-off vocal kind of thing like a lot of other bands, but the way they do it, I think stands out from the pack because of John's lyrics, which are pretty interesting. <laughs> For example, Or, 
At first, it just seems like he's kind of screaming random nonsense words, right? But there's actually a little bit more going on there. First of all, if you're the kind of person that loves Dance Gavin Dance, you've probably also got a little bit of the like Rick and Morty thing going on and blurting out weird random shit is probably right up your alley. And second, it creates this whole like lore rabbit hole of people trying to decode what his lyrics mean. And when you dig deeper, it turns out that they're not all just random nonsense, that there's actually a lot of references there to things that their audience finds very relatable. For example, like Diablo and Starcraft, dealing with mental health issues. And to be super clear, I don't mean the mental health thing in a disrespectful way at all. I think hearing that he and other people in the band may be struggling with those things actually helps their audience a lot. So if you add all that up, what you see is that, yeah, maybe they don't have like a big Ollie Sykes type mega charismatic front man in the band, but instead what they have is something more of like a Friends or Seinfeld like ensemble cast kind of thing where everybody in the band brings something different to the table and it adds up to something more than the sum of the parts. Wow, 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 wow. And lastly, the community that they've built up around the band. I've kind of joked around before about how intense their fandom can be, and it is, but isn't that kind of what every band should want? They started out as a warp Tour, like post-hardcore scene kind of band. They were, after all, on Rise Records, which was the definitive warp Tour scene label. But since then, have really kind of created their own scene within a scene. Kind of reminds me of how like Dillinger Escape Plan started out in the hardcore scene, but very quickly transcended that and built their own thing that existed kind of outside and adjacent to the hardcore scene in the same way as the Dance Gavin Dance swan core scene kind of sits alongside the larger post-hardcore scene. And to be clear, I don't think they did any of this as some sort of like calculated marketing move where they sat down with a bunch of charts and were like, how can we increase fan loyalty by 25% this quarter? But I do think the way they've approached this is really smart. They've created lore around the band by using like a consistent visual aesthetic over the years with all these characters that you kind of recognize and with all the deep references and the lyrics they've really built that out like for example they put out this graphic novel which tells the story of that robot character and i guess some of the themes in the lyrics mirroring the band's deconstructive approach paired with humor robot's tale brings together the comic book wit of writer elliot rahal and artist ian mcginty who utilized the band's animal imagery to tell a story with heady themes of existence as experienced through the perceptions of its anthropomorphic antagonist upon the discovery that the universe is merely a simulation in which all living things are trapped. <laughs> like there's actual lore here that the fans can geek out on and dive deep into and then start to have a much deeper relationship to the music than just like, oh, that's a cool song. I like that part. It really becomes this whole universe that they can immerse themselves in. Another smart thing that they've done, which I think is partly official, partly unofficial, is created a lot of different places where that community can come together and interact with each other. Because where communities like this become really, really powerful is when they transcend the band itself and become like a network of friends. World of Warcraft is actually a good example of that. The WoW community is about way more than just the game. Like one of my friends from high school met his wife on WoW, which sounds kind of weird, I guess, but you know, they've been happily married for like 10 years. And there's probably hundreds and hundreds of other stories like that, which is part of why WoW was such a massive success. You can just hang outside in the sun all day tossing a ball around, or you can sit at your computer and do something that matters. With Dance Gavin Dance, they do that IRL at their shows and at their festival, Swan Fest. The one for this year in 2020 has unfortunately been postponed due to the pandemic. But if you look at the lineup, you can see how smart it is and how they've brought together the Swan Core community itself, but also some adjacent bands that are different, but definitely fit in. Animals as Leaders, Knocked Loose, Movements, Crown the Empire, Issues, The Fall of Troy, Icy Stars, Veil of Maya, Hail the Sun, and a couple others. Very, very smart booking on their part. One thing in particular that I really liked is the fan sourced video they did for the song Three Wishes off their latest album, which also happens to be the Dance Gavin Dance song that I like the most. But what's really smart about this is that it makes the fans part of it in a way that's just not true of a lot of other bands. Again, I don't think they were doing this in any kind of like calculated, exploitative way, but what a great idea. What Dance Gavin Dance has done in a lot of ways reminds me of My Chemical Romance. They've created a universe of lore around the band. They've brought people together online and in real life with the band kind of at the center of the thing. But the fandom has become much more than just a bunch of people who like the same band. 
It's become an identity and in the same way as the Killjoys are an identity or Slipknot's fandom is an identity, the Maggots, Lady Gaga's Little Monsters, Black Veil Brides, BVB Army. You can see how powerful it is when bands are able to create this community around them. And I mean that not just from like a cynical marketing perspective, but I think it legitimately helps people to feel less alone and to feel like they're connected with something bigger than themselves. Yes, it can get a little bit intense and toxic at times, which is the reason why I was a little bit nervous about making this video in the first place, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast. That kind of passion is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, that passion is the reason why their fans love them so much and will support everything they do forever. On the other hand, it's also why they can go a little bit overboard. I mean, even among the Dance Gavin Dance fandom, there's a recognition that there's a certain segment of the fandom that can be a little bit toxic. For example, this Reddit thread, Swan Posting is a Disease. Swan Posting is the Dance Gavin Dance Facebook group. Check that page out a few weeks ago out of curiosity. What a horrible experience. By the time I was done, I almost felt bad for still being a Dance Gavin Dance fan in 2018. Yeah, I can understand John hating the fan base if this is all he sees. Or this one, I think it's time to leave Swan Posting groups for good. I've never been to the group, but all I hear is that it's pure cancer. Yep, I joined it thinking there would be some good discussions going on. Instead, it's an absolute cringe fest. So it cuts both ways, but I don't think you can have that passion. I don't think you can have one without the other. It's probably the same kind of reason that the My Chemical Romance fandom can also get a little bit intense at times. But the bottom line is that their fans are not just fans. They fucking live and die for this band, and they become almost like a little army of evangelists who feel like it's their duty to go out into the world and spread the gospel of Swancore. And as an artist, what better marketing could you wish for than that? An army of fans out there promoting your band just out of pure joy and passion. This is so much fun. All right, so to wrap it up, there are two big takeaways here to me. For one, not everyone is gonna like your music, and that's okay. You don't need everybody to like your music. Like, as much as I respect Dance Gavin Dance for all the reasons I just talked about, I don't really like their music. I don't have the Weedly Weedly gene, so it's just not for me. But that's not a bad thing, right? They don't need me to like their band. Instead of focusing on the people who don't like their band, they've focused on the people that do. They've super served that audience, and by doing so has created this insanely dedicated fan base that will support them pretty much forever, I think. I could totally imagine these guys being like Fish or the Grateful Dead playing shows for another 30, 40 years. And second, bands like them and Dillinger Escape Plan proved that you can achieve something pretty close to commercial success while playing music that's honestly pretty fucking weird. Again, I think the key is to understand who your audience is, who you're making your music for, and just double, triple down on those people and making them happy rather than the classic mistake of like trying to broaden your fan base by doing something that on paper is more accessible, but 99 times out of 100 ends up just alienating everybody and ruining your career. All right, my friends, that is the long-awaited Dance Gavin Dance video. I would love to know what you think in the comments. Are you a fan? Are you not a fan? What do you think they've done right? Where do you see the future of the band going? Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you haven't yet, please check out the Punk Rock NBA podcast. There's a link to that in the description. Also, if you want to talk about business with me, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I've been publishing a lot of content over there that I think is pretty cool. There's a link to that in the description. And lastly, I would like to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things. Thanks to all of you. I was able to hire a producer and editor to make the whole podcast happen. If you are interested in supporting the show, you can check that out at the link in the description as well. There's an opportunity to have me review your band or YouTube channel or podcast. You get every episode of the podcast a week early. There's some other perks. So if that sounds cool to you, check it out at the link in the description. And I will sign off for now, but I will see you next time.